Hi, everyone, and welcome to iSpot's seventh annual TV Disrupt. We're so thrilled so many of you are tuning in today. We've got great representation from networks, agencies, and brands across industries. I'm Sammy, Senior Marketing Campaign Manager here at iSpot, and I'll be your moderator for today's event. We've got an amazing lineup from the buy and sell side of TV advertising. We're going to be covering the most pressing topics from alternative currencies to cross-screen measurement. As for support, you can find today's agenda in the Zoom chat. You can also reach us there with any questions or if you need technical support during the event. Now let's get to it. It's my absolute honor to introduce iSpot CEO and founder, Sean Mueller. Take it away, Sean. Thank you, Sammy, and welcome everybody to iSpot's seventh annual TV Disrupt. We are so excited and delighted that you took the time to be with us uh, here today. You will not be disappointed. We have a great agenda teed up. Our mission here at this year's TV Disrupt is to help you navigate the whole new era here of TV currency and measurement. In today's uh, sessions, you will explore a range of topics that are, are related to transacting on alternative currencies. You will learn about a variety of tests and learns that have been run by NBCU and others. You will hear from the sell side. You will hear from the buy side. You will hear about what it actually means to transact on alternative currencies. How real is it? and what you may expect at this year's uh, upfronts and beyond. So we know that you and the industries are craving for information about alternative currencies. And this is what we're gonna dedicate the next hour and a half to hour and 45 minutes, uh, minutes to. So as we dive in, I wanted to start by sharing some results from a, a recent survey that we, uh, we ran against our over 400 advertiser clients. So we asked them how interested they are in transacting on non-legacy currencies at this year's upfront. As you can see, a third of advertisers have indicated that they're very interested in transacting on non-Nielsen um, currencies at this year's upfront. 50% said they're somewhat interested but need to learn more, which is why today's TV disrupt is, is, is so important. And only 17% had indicated uh, that they would not be interested in transacting on alternative currencies at this year's upfront. So without further ado, let's just let's get right into today's agenda, which you can see up on your screen. So first and foremost, you're going to hear from the sell side. You're going to hear from Kelly Upkarian at NBCU. You're going to hear from Andrea Zapata at Warner Media, And you're going to hear from Travis Scholes of Paramount. And you're going to hear each of their unique, unique perspectives on this year's upcoming upfronts, as well as how they plan to approach alternative currencies. You're going to hear from the buy side. You're going to hear from Lauren Sitkowski from Wayfair, and she's going to take us through her learnings from uh, the recent tests and learn with NBCU. You're also going to hear from Amy Bartle uh, from Tax Act, who will take us through their approach to cross-screen measurement, optimization, and transacting. And you're gonna hear from Jonathan Lowe from the Trade Desk, who's gonna take us through how the Trade Desk is thinking about cross-screen uh, measurement and why they have selected iSpot as their default cross-screen measurement. Finally, you're gonna to get to meet CMO's newly minted CMO, Mike Katz, and we're gonna have a very engaging conversation about the DNA of disruption, which is gonna be very relevant to everything that's happening in the measurement industry uh, today. Before we jump into the agenda, I really just wanna set the stage of why we're even here and why the industry at large is talking about alternative currencies. 
And in all of the work that we've done, we've really found that there's really three key drivers for alternative, alternative currency. In other words, these are three key things that are not addressed by the legacy currency today that the, both the buy and the sell side are really looking to solve for. So first and foremost, the first and primary driver for alternative currency is cross-screen. We all know the consumers today are consuming streaming environments uh, in a rapidly increasing manner. So we need our measurement and our currency to follow that path. And we need our measurement and currency to measure linear, streaming, out of home, and really all formats for both the programs and the ads in a unified manner. In fact, our survey found that 26% of large TV advertisers plan to, to allocate more than 20% of their budgets to streaming in this coming year's upfront. And that is up from only 7% a year ago. So that underscores the importance of being able to transact in a cross screen manner. The second big driver is the speed of reporting and insights. We're living in a world where we need data and we need information and we need it fast because if we don't have it in our hand, we can't act on it. So in the old world, we had data and, and, and true ups and, and actuals being delivered weeks and weeks behind. In this new world, we need to deliver actual results of audience delivery and impact within 24 to 48 hours. Finally, another major driver of the need for alternative currency is we need to be able to measure the ads independently from the programs. In the old world, we always counted on the ads traveling with the programs. And so measuring the programs gave us a proxy for the ads. In this new alternative currency, in this new world, we have to have technologies in place that are able to measure the ads independently from the programs because the ads are no longer traveling with the programs Plus, there is a wide uh, variation in the audiences and ads, even within the same program. Case in point, if you take the last Super Bowl, the difference between the ad that had the most audience at roughly 119 million viewers and the ad that had the least amount of audience at roughly 97 million viewers was 24%. That's almost 20 million viewers. And that's for a program that actually has less variation in the ads than most other programs. So this underscores the need to be able to measure the ads independently from the programs. All right, without further ado, I wanna jump right into the content because it is, um, um, it is so good. So what I wanna do is introduce our first guest. Um, she was recently hired at NBCU. She has been there for about a year now. And she's a major, major driving force in the changes that we are seeing across the industry. She's already had massive impact on the industry in only being at NBCU for one year. Please welcome the EVP for Measurement and Impact from NBCU, Kelly Upkarian. All right, hey Kelly, and welcome to TV Disrupt. Thanks, Sean, excited to be here. Yeah, it's great to uh, it's great to have you on today, and I'm really excited for the session because we're going to give our audience here a behind the scenes look at what NBCU is doing in preparation uh, for this year's upfronts. But before we get into that, so as I mentioned uh, to the audience, you've been at NBCU now, I think, for almost exactly a year. Is that right? Are you? Is it about a year? Yep, just about it. Just a little over a year now. All right, so give us a quick reflection of your one year. You've, you've clearly done a lot there, but just give us a quick reflection on the one year at NBCU. Yeah, look, I think coming into this role, um, solving for cross-platform measurement was the North Star. You know, when I came here, Peacock had already launched during the COVID time period and being able to measure that growing, very important streaming audience uh, was critically important for us to get in front of. And there was no putting the streaming consumer back in the bottle. Um, you know, it was time to really connect 
all of our audience, regardless of where and how they wanted to watch our content and ensure that we were making our content available where, when and how they wanted to watch it. So, you know, it's, it's been a busy year. We kicked off um, in August with a kind of de declaration around measurement independence. And that was really more about like really breaking the industry of legacy mindset, legacy thinking, and how could we move forward and usher in a brand new advertising and measurement era? And how could we bring forward a different way in which to measure our audiences? And really it was started with thinking about how do we actually measure ads and all ads and all ads fast. Yeah, and so, so you came into NBCU, you declared the measurement independence, uh, you kicked off this monstrous RFP process. Uh, and then at your 122 event, you, you declared that um, iSpot's gonna be the default uh, currency here for this year's upfront. So I don't wanna spend a lot of time here rehashing this RFP because I, I think that's been covered to every which way it's Tuesday here. And we know you put together a great lookbook, but maybe just like literally at a very high level, tell us, tell, tell our audience before we get into the meat here about the process and kind of the conclusions coming out of it. Yeah, look, we thought it was really important to, um, you know, formalize a certification process. So that's really the stage that we're in now. At our 122 event, we announced the first set of certifications across audience measurement and audience verification, two of the six categories we issued the RFP around. And it was really about bringing full transparency. You know, that's why we published the lookbook, 25 attributes that we scored across eight cross-platform measurement capabilities, as well as looking at the ingredients that drive the ability to get a complete holistic understanding of our audiences. And you know, what it comes down to at the end is um, as we continue to have our own access to first party data, we need to be very privacy minded around how we work with our measurement partners with that data. And so rolling out a formal cross certification part process was pretty important um, around making sure that we could trust the partners that we work with, as well as ensure that the way in which that measurement is represented and reflected could be trusted more importantly by our advertisers. And I think that's one of the key reasons why iSpot is our first certified partner. You know, it can be summed up in that one word of trust. Uh, the top 50% of the top 100 TV advertisers, I don't have to tell you, Sean, work with iSpot day in and day out, and they have trust and belief in your measurement. And, um, and you're solving the advertiser needs that we've been hearing from our clients for many, many years. They want a transparent view of their ads across all platforms, unduplicated, in which to understand only, only both. They want accuracy powered by big data so that they can get granular and bring their first party data. So the, the way in which they target can be the way in which they get measured. And they want speed, you know, speed of insights, the ability to actually affect the plan in flight, not try to affect the next plan down the road. And so I think, you know, what we've brought forward with a number of these tests and learns is to actually bring that type of capability into the hands of our advertisers to prove that solving for these needs is here and ready to go now. And we don't have to wait until 2024 to get started. Yeah. So Kelly, let's just dive right into everything that's transpired here in, in, in Q1, because it's been, uh, and obviously beginning of Q2 as well, because it's been a pretty heavy lift, right? Like to, to get the industry's mentality to start, to start shifting. So obviously we get past all this RFP uh, stuff, but now is where the real action starts. So let's talk, let's start by talking about probably two of the largest TV events <laughs> that, that we have and the Olympics and Super Bowl. So can you take, um, can you take our audience through, let, let's start with that, with, with Super Bowl and Olympics, some of the work that was done to introduce alternative measures and alternative currencies. And what really, what are some of the big takeaways and, and, and big learnings from that? Yeah, look, I think um, 
the work we did together to really turn from a pixel-based solution to true server-to-server -server integration was the first key step, right? So we could have always-on measurement in which to enable any advertiser to get an understanding of their delivery across any campaign that's in flight, um, as well as you can imagine historical data as we move ahead. And so I think the work we did together to really try to solve that, right? There's multiple players involved. It's not just us and NBCU, it's Freewheel, it's the ad servers, it's you know the multiple ways in which we um, serve the ads up and partnering with all of those um, ad servers as well as other partners like Conviva who helped us on the content measurement side is really critically important that we are moving to a world of interoperability. And we often like to use those terms, but often we don't show a lot of proof points of those terms in true action. Here we built server-to-server -server integration between us, you, and Freewheel. We also built server-to-server -server integration between us, you, and Conviva. You know, and not only just a one-time, but we were delivering data daily across being able to create cross-platform ad measurement and cross-platform content measurement. And I think, you know, we learned a lot through that process. You know, the ability to really get down to an advertiser brand level in which to map this data so you can report at a brand level takes real effort and lifting across everyone. You know, I think we as an industry still have more to do around standardization of ad ID or a taxonomy of metadata so that we can better connect the creatives across all the ways in which creatives are being distributed. At NBCU, we've adopted ad ID. We really want, really want to see the ad servers and the measurement companies embrace that and bring that metadata through um, because we think it drives simplification across all of us to have kind of one source of truth around what it is that this ad is defined as, which is critically important when you're really working at measuring the discrete ads as we move ahead. I would say in terms of insights, um, Sean, I think the most interesting thing is uh, two things. You know, we learned a lot about our streaming audiences on these big tentpole events. You know, we really changed up the access around the winter games coming off of the heels of the summer games, which wasn't too long before that, and really learning how our consumers on Peacock really want to be able to engage in the games and the discovery of the games on that platform. And it, the results proved itself, right? We saw 66% view exclusively on Peacock or our other digital endpoints across our total reach of the winter games. Um, and we, you know, on Super Bowl, a similar trend, 70% of all streamers that were streaming were cord cutters. And so we were able to effectively reach those consumers who have effectively decided that the way forward for them to consume great premium content is to you know, consume that on our streaming platform. I would say lastly, you know, by measuring the ads, we were really able to understand those unique moments. You, know, you think about the winter games, every second matters you know, to every athlete and every second matters to every advertiser. Because at the end of the day, day, when you're able to measure those ad moments in those second by second, you can really understand the, the variance across the delivery. You know, in Super Bowl, we saw ad variance from 22% on the highest to the lowest audience um, in terms of kind of the spread of, of the ad delivery. And, um, you know, I think that's what makes this new world so exciting we can all work together around how we want to optimize the creative, the placement, you know, putting it into context of the right stories. Um, because when you can actually measure the ad delivery, you can actually do something about how to optimize it for the consumer to really have the impact desired across all of us. And, and Kelly, how, how would you say this year was different in terms of the Olympics and Super Bowl and really having two different measurement data sets that you guys are looking at, whereas historically, there's really only one that you're looking at. So what would you say were some of the benefits and challenges of doing that? Yeah, I mean, I think the benefits is that we were seeing measurement within 24 or less hours on the content side and, and 48 hours on the ad side. 
And being able to see reach and frequency metrics that often took weeks in which to understand uh, we were seeing in hours, not days or you know, many weeks. Um, so that was a huge benefit. You could think about uh, for our advertisers, the types of optimization we could do together, being able to see that audience across as you know, the games are unfolding. Um, I would say on the kind of challenging side, it's a whole new language in which to educate the marketplace on and um, not just, you know, the marketplace at large, but also even our internal teams to help them understand the new narrative around the types of things we can measure when we're measuring the discrete ads um, and how to speak to um, the marketplace about that share voice, you know, in terms of ad impressions talk about completion and interruption rates, talk about ad loads, things that historically have not been the focus when you go and read headlines about the Olympics or the Super Bowl, right? It's always about what was the size of the audience that showed up last night, often only talking about linear, not even talking about the size of the audience across all screens. So I think it's, it's gonna take some time for all of us to work this new language and this new you know, error of advertising and measurement we're ushering in, but I was very excited to be able to see the pickup that we started to get traction on and the excitement that you could see around the language of the advertiser that was being amplified out to the market. Right, so let's just get right to the excitement of the advertiser there. So, so let's dive into this test and learn because I know everyone here wants to learn more about it. So you undertook a massive, test to learn of much larger than really any other test to learn that's going on in the market where 66 advertisers across all holding companies are concurrently testing cross screen measurement as an alternative uh, currency. Can you take um, us through, first of all, what it's taken to get that off the ground and maybe some of the top learnings uh, thus far from the test and learn? Yeah, look, we have over 400 users um, logging in, you know, over 2000 reports have been pulled to date. Um, and the uh, users span all categories, right? We have auto, travel and resort, quick serve, pharma, entertainment and more. And, you know, I think um, the work we've done to also bring education um, forward of how to think about the new metrics and the new measurement has been well received. And, you know, we recently um, fielded a survey to try to get a sense of, you know, where is the industry's head at? And um, really all respondents, I think, in terms of what it is that we're solving for, cross-platform delivery scored a perfect 100%, right? They're all saying this solves a critical need. This is starting to actually um, help to affect the problem. Yes, we still have work to do, right? One of the lessons learned, Sean, as you know, is that we're working on how to feed in programmatic deals, right? Right now we've, you know, really fed in all the direct IO deals. And so it's these types of learnings that I think are valuable in these environments to really think through how everything's evolving. The second thing that we heard loud and clear is just this independent impression verification. We've got work to do to help people understand moving from equivalized to unequivalized because now we can measure television truly like digital. Right, we can measure at a true second by second and true exactness. So we're really moving from units to impressions. We're moving from averages to exactness, and we're moving from proxies to advertiser-defined audiences. And um, I think this is helping to create that full consumer picture. I'd say the third um, thing that we've heard is, I think there's been um, a lot of receptivity of measurement at the brand exact ad level but we all have work to do around how do we translate that into how people are defining campaigns and deals, um, you know, and to get the data to um, kind of roll up, if you will, or line up in the way in which without a whole lot of heavy lifting that we don't want to put on the industry so that we can keep at that precision of measurement at the exact brand level, um, but not put on a big, um, kind of workload on the industry around, you know, how to roll all that data up. And then I would say, you know, speed of delivery has been um, really good. You know, Sean, I've heard comments like, 
you know, iSpot's come a long way, you know, a year and a half ago, they, there was the promise of the speed of delivery. It wasn't quite there, but now we see it fully coming to bright. Um, so I think, you know, it's, it's always good to get such a um, diverse set of categories and advertisers and campaigns and deal types, because that's when you understand, you know, where do we still have work to do? Where are things ready to go now? And, you know, I feel really great about um, the fact that we are in, I think, week eight now of the final um, kind of test and learn office hours. And um, we've uh, come a long way. And I think in general, we've had data running since February 1st to present. And I'll just highlight kind of one, one key step from just one advertiser that I won't disclose the, the brand of the advertiser, but very large um, brand. And we're seeing, once again, those valuable insights that we knew about streaming audiences that we couldn't connect back to linear. And now we can. You know, for this one advertiser campaign where their total unique reach was around 65%, we're seeing almost half of that come from uh, streaming platforms, about 32.7%. So the, and, and the average frequency of that plan is also pretty enlightening when you think about how you can manage and control for frequency as we move ahead. The streaming of that plan is 2.2 versus in linear, it's around 7.8. So there's so much opportunity to drive better, efficient and quality reach optimization when you can really measure it all. And then we can start moving from reporting it to truly managing and executing together around optimizing it. All right. All right. So let's move to the execution uh, portion of this. We're, we're clearly here at the eve of, of the upfronts and, and we're, there's a lot of change happening. I, th I think the most stark change is the cross screen and how quickly that's evolving and how much of the audience reach and delivery is actually starting to come from cross screen. So what can you share with the audience today about what we can expect? Because everybody's waiting in anticipation, right? Is this alternative currency real? Is it going to happen this year? Is it going to happen next year? To what degree? And, and so what can you share with the audience about that? Look, I think there's a lot of moving pieces. And uh, to your point, Sean, the industry is watching it all unfold. But we're starting to see people act and transact. And I do think that in this upfront, we're gonna see the market move to alternative currencies with a full acceleration in next year's upfront. So in other words, we're gonna to start to set the baseline this year as change is coming and the industry is gonna adopt the new currencies that help them unlock the value that they are seeking to understand the full delivery of their campaigns across all endpoints because it's important for advertisers, but it's also for important for the consumer experience alike. So, you know, I think we're gonna see some first movers um, in this upfront and people really leaning in um, who are ready to go and see the value and, you know, are really heavy enough on digital and wanna make sure they can understand how that digital plan is delivering vis-a-vis -vis their linear buy. And um, I think we're really excited Awesome. And, and so as I shared earlier from our customer uh, survey, there's about 17% of advertisers that are ready to transact and willing and interested in transacting an alternative currency. And about 50% are interested, but are unsure. They want to learn more. What, what advice would you give to those advertisers in particular that are kind of in that state that, yeah, I'm interested in it, but, but I need to learn more? Look, I would, I would suggest that, you know, move a percent of your spend across, um, you know, we, we really all need to understand our, our, is what we're measuring really what matters. And um, I think we owe it our, to our, all of ourselves to explore the solutions and the clock is ticking. You know, in 2024, the currency that our industry uses today is changing and um, it's going to completely disappear, which means that we'll no longer be able to rely on the same year over year comparisons. We're kind of starting over effectively from scratch. That's why we're focused on getting started now and not years from now. And so I think, you know, as we work together, you know, I think we can 
you know, start to show um, progress in this direction, um, it's going to help us solve some of the industry's, you know, mo most pressing problems, whether that's inflation, whether that's excess frequency, or it's just plain old waste. And so I would just encourage everyone to lean into the potential um, of moving to kind of true impression delivery um, and advanced audiences. If you're not quite ready to kind of go full um, across, I would highly recommend, you know, go and transact on advanced audiences. It's such a great way to drive an ability to understand both the capabilities of um, onboarding and bringing your first party data, but also finding, you know, that, that unique audience you're trying to reach across platforms and start to understand the benefits of what the big data really brings to help you drive that true cross-platform optimization. And, um, you know, we're open for business. We have NBC unified in that regards to kind of help bring um, additional insights around um, audience targets. And I think what's most exciting is, you know, the day has come where using one data set for targeting and a different set for measurement um, is behind us. And I think that's so critically important because in order to really help an advertiser optimize, you really need to measure this, the target on the same yardstick that you measure the, um, uh, the execution. And so I think the advice I would probably give to them, Sean, is that the future is going to favor the brave and the bold. And I would, I'd recommend, um, you know, advertisers, if they haven't, participated in a test and learn, get involved. If it's not with MBCU, which is would be our preference, then you know, lean into one of the other networks. We're all collectively trying to push forward um, really a kind of future of better measurement that's focused on the advertiser. And so if you haven't gotten engaged, don't wait because um, the future is here. And uh, the future uh, of cross-platform measurement is ready to go for those who want to lean in. Yeah, I, I really like that message. I mean, change is coming. So don't wait to embrace it, right? Because you won't be ready for it. This is, this is the time to do it. All right, Kelly, thank you uh, so much for being uh, with us here today and for all the great work you're doing to move the industry forward. Thank you, Kelly. Thank you. So you've just learned from Kelly and NBCU all about these tests and learns and, and this year's uh, upcoming upfront and alternative currencies. And there was a lot of great learnings in there, but let's shift our attention now to the buy side. And I'm particularly excited here uh, to welcome Lauren Sutkowski, who is the head of TV and branded content marketing at Wayfair, who was one of the 60 plus brands who participated in this uh, test and learn. And Lauren is gonna take us um, from the buy side lens and, um, and take us through all of Wayfair's uh, learning and thoughts and experiences coming out of this test and learn. So Lauren, thank you so much uh, for being with us here today and welcome. Thanks, Sean. Um, I'm excited to take everyone through our uh, test and learn environment with iSpot and NBC. Um, before I dive into that, though, I want to spend a little bit of time talking about Wavier's broader approach to marketing and how we essentially plan our TV marketing channel. So overall, Wayfair sees marketing as a huge lever to unlock growth. Um, with that, we don't actually use any budgets across our marketing channels. Um, there's no marketing spends X, Y, Z and channels kind of duking it out for their share of spend. Instead, there's really an emphasis on building our spend forecast from the bottoms up um, to make sure that we're spending at the appropriate level to achieve efficient growth. And so that essentially allows every channel to have the runway and leeway to accomplish growth and drive growth. And it also gives us a little more autonomy to make sure that every channel is truly optimizing based on performance and capitalizing on trends when they see fit. So for TV, we have a little bit of a multi-pronged approach to accomplishing that. So the first key KPI that we look at when we build our spend forecasts in our TV campaigns 
is incremental revenue that we're driving. So we have a pretty narrow lens of what it truly means to be incremental. And so we are constantly looking to quantify the impact that that last TV touch point had on a purchaser's um, ultimate journey and conversion. And so we actually use the iSpot individual user level data feed to help enable a lot of this. And we look at incremental revenue, the TV drives both at a total TV level, as well as at the individual network level. The other way that we build our forecasts and our spend for TV is we use a media impact survey to help us figure out for those harder to quantify pieces like brand perceptions and awareness of emerging categories, we use a media impact survey that's essentially always on and allows us to pinpoint brand health of TV exposed and TV unexposed, unexposed audiences over a variety of dimensions. And so, again, we love our data at Wayfair, so we are always looking for more ways to support a data-driven approach and more opportunities to measure everything that we're doing. So with that, we were incredibly excited to partner with NBC and iSpot on this test and learn environment. Ultimately, our goal coming out of this was we wanted to be able to add a granular level of visibility into our delivery across linear and digital. I think we've historically uh, tended to view those worlds as somewhat separate silos um, just for the sake of campaign planning because it, it can get hard to really understand how they play together. And so NBC um, set us up very nicely. Um, shout out to the entire NBC team that put together a curriculum and has had uh, weekly training sessions and Q&A sessions for us to walk through things. Um, I got a little nervous when Kelly in the first session mentioned that there would be a syllabus and homework every week. Um, but so far, it's been, I would say, very, very seamless from an advertiser perspective. And for Wayfair, we were just really excited to get that cross-platform view of our video campaigns. We had some hypotheses going into this around which platforms would truly be incremental to what we're doing on Linear. Um, but we really wanted to be able to validate that. And then we kind of saw the next layer was, once we validate which platforms are incremental, how can we use that to help really tailor our creative messaging by platform? And so with that, we had a few pretty exciting findings that we learned. So the first one that I'll share here is we found that one NBC digital platform, 40% of our impressions on that platform were entirely incremental to our linear impressions. This was incredibly exciting for us because we do not have a small footprint on NBC Universal properties. We have a pretty strong linear presence across the board on NBC networks. And so we were a little afraid that there, uh, it might be hard to really drive double digit incremental reach there. Um, and so we were incredibly excited about this finding. Um, and I know I haven't named the platform that is intentional based on our PR team. So apologies for keeping it anonymous, but we were incredibly excited by this finding. I think another finding that we thought was really interesting was we have a really, really uh, strong presence on news programming across NBC's linear networks, including MSNBC, NBC AM, and PM News. We on linear have found that this is a, a pretty high value audience for us. And so we've prioritized seeking those uh, audiences out on linear. Turns out we are not tapped out in the slightest on news networks. So uh, our one digital video news programming also drove really significant incremental reach, which I think we didn't necessarily think would be all of that feasible on um, news programming given our linear presence. And so for us, I think we were pretty hesitant to lean more heavily into news there. But ultimately, it turns out that's a pretty significant unlock for us. So that was another exciting finding that we found. And so thinking about how we want to translate these into next steps and how we really want to action on these key learnings, um, I think one big piece to acknowledge is Wayfair has historically taken a linear-led approach to CTV and linear TV. We've essentially said CTV should be entirely complementary to everything that we're doing on linear. So on linear, we can you know air whatever messages we want, but their mass reach where CTV will allow us to make sure that we're hitting people the exact number of times that we want to hit them. And it'll also make sure that we're hitting people with the right messages at the right time in their customer journey. And 
think one thing we were a little hesitant about or, or nervous about was being able to accomplish that effectively with our network direct buys. So if you go through a DSP, it's one thing, you know, you feel like you can do sequential messaging, suppress certain screens a little more, you know, easily and directly. Um, ultimately, this test and learn made it really clear that we were thinking too myopically about that and that we really can get, you know, with the right insights, we can be incredibly tailored and incredibly intentional with all of these network direct digital buys that we're doing. So we were incredibly excited to learn that we really can build these digital buys to be complementary around our linear campaigns. And then I think another key learning that came out of this was, you know, I talked about wanting to be linear led with CTV kind of as a complementary layer. And at the end of the day, we want to take a similar approach with all of our messaging. So we've realized certain platforms are driving significantly more incremental reach than we realized. And those are the platforms where we really need to be intentional about pushing our core furniture and decor, core evergreen Wayfair messaging to make sure that those audiences are starting to get familiar with Wayfair since they're, they're ultimately not seeing us on TV. And then there have been other platforms where we realize they're much, much stronger frequency plays than incremental reach drivers. And so we need to be tailoring our creative to align and support that. So Wayfair is always trying to push, you know, this whole subset of emerging categories that we have. Uh, whether you are a past Wayfair purchaser or not, you might not know that we offer large appliances, for example. What we can do with these um, extra findings on these frequency networks is we can tailor our messages pretty exclusively to those emerging categories to make sure that those mature audiences are, are seeing the creatives and campaigns and value props that we want them to see. And I think one thing that's been a theme across all of this is whether or not an audience is a frequency driver or a platform, I'll say, is a frequency driver or a reach driver is a lot more agnostic of our linear spend levels than we had initially anticipated. So we've been able to disprove a few hypotheses there and make sure that we're really effective with the way that we're spending on digital. So at the end of the day, I think we have a few, I have a few recommendations or thoughts I'll say based on this study. Um, I mentioned earlier, you know, Wayfair is constantly looking for more data. We always want stronger measurement models to validate and you know, measure the efficacy of our performance. And so this test and learn environment really provided us the leeway for that and has really given us insights that we certainly did not have opportunity uh, to dig into beforehand. And we've been able to discover new opportunities and really make sure that we're tailoring our campaigns effectively and optimizing in the way that we need to. Um, and this is also going to influence our approach to upfront. So this is helping us achieve a more appropriate, um, more ideal balance between digital opportunities and our linear led campaign. So with that, um, I think I'm passing it back to you, Sean. Um, thank you for having me. All right. Thank you so much, Laura, Lauren. It was uh, really interesting to hear from the other side of the equation. And it's exciting to see how brands like Wayfair are thinking about shaping their future upfront plans around alternative uh, currency. So I know our audience uh, had a lot of great takeaways uh, from this session. So thank you, Lauren. So next up, we have Amy Bartle, who is the head of media of Tax Act. And Amy is going to show us the importance of cross-screen measurement and how she has modernized tax, tax acts, um, marketing strategies with cross screen and why you should yours as well. So Amy, thank you for being here and welcome to TV Disrupt. Thanks, Sean. As he said, joining us today is Amy Bartle, head of media tax act. Hi, Amy, welcome to TV Disrupt. Hi, Sammy, it's good to be here. I'm excited to have this conversation. It's great to have you here, and we really appreciate you joining us at the end of a very busy tax season, which we're about to get into. Um, but I'm really looking forward to this conversation about cross-screen measurement and how Tax Act has been lever leveraging modern TV ad measurement to, you know, optimize your campaigns. So um, let's start off at a, a very high level and give the audience an overview of 
um, what TaxAct's general approach is to TV advertising and how it's evolved maybe over the years as the industry has changed. Got it. So, yeah, as we all know, you know, TV's come on quite a journey. And, you know, if we start first for Tax Act um, as an on, as a provider of online tax filing services, you know, we're not the biggest name in the in the space. And as, so as a challenger brand, you know, our ability to reach consumers in cost efficient ways, our ability to build brand and our ability to drive sales are all incredibly important. Um, and as we look to video, um, when you're less well known, when potentially your consumers need a full introduction, there's nothing better than sight, sound, and motion to do that. Um, we've also come a long way from the days where you have your linear TV by, all it could do is drive awareness, and what it did beyond that was in the province of mixed models. Now, don't get me wrong, I love mixed models, I use mixed models, they're, they're another tool in the arsenal. But the advances forward, both in terms of video delivery, so you've got, got video in channels from linear and streaming to online video and other partners, is the ability to now monitor and measure those various channels separately and to, together in a much faster speed than we were able to do in the past has been really helpful. Awesome. Um, so you guys are a, a little different than most brands in that seasonality impacts your campaigns. <laughs> Could so you, for, yeah, yeah, for our, re, for our retail friends, think Black Friday, 105 days in a row. That's about <laughs> what tax season looks like. Oh my goodness. Madness. Um, could you lend a little insight into your approach to TV advertising, maybe throughout the year, but really hone in on that tax season campaign? Certainly. So um, again, as I said, we provide your online, uh, online services to file your taxes. So for us, um, January through, knock on wood, April 15th, normal filing deadlines, uh, the last two extended seasons have been rough. But you know, in essence, you've got Q1 and a few minutes of, of Q2 before the tax filing deadline. And that is really when over 90% of your activity happens. Um, so from our perspective, in terms of our um, heaviest investments and largest campaigns for media, they run within the tax season proper. There is certainly some extended activity in terms of late filers, extension filers, all culminating in October. But for us, our media launches um, in anywhere from mid-December to early January, and then we run through tax season, and we effectively, for the majority of our tactics, go dark um, the day after the tax filing deadline. So it literally is an entire year of campaigning and revenue production in 16 weeks. So tax season has a very unique seasonality contained with its entirely a very short time frame is there is in January, or late January, around the time people are getting their tax documents, particularly their W-2s, and the IRS um, begins accepting e-file submissions from providers, is we have what we term peak one. Prior to that time, that early January uh, time period is an opportunity for us to launch our campaigns, really focus on um, the awareness uh, delivered by various mediums. So we're quite often looking for reach plays while we're running into this, this awareness mode and focusing more on reach and keeping an eye on frequency. We're also looking at um, the performance of things like site visits or starts uh, through our iSpot reporting. So at this stage of the game, our goal is about delivery of volume, uh, because again, this is the awareness component of our um, campaigns. 
but we're also learning along the way about which networks are giving early signals um, that they could be stronger performance as we move into the mid and lower funnel. Um, you know, as we move through this period at the end of January and early February, where we get this first rush of filers and we start to get enough activity in market so that you know, the, the algorithms and the volume start to send stronger signals, we then take that learning. And as we get into the, the middle to towards the back half of the season, what we term the trough period, there's lower volume, but more consistent volume of activity through there. And that really becomes an efficiency and optimization game. So, you know, within that time period, you know, we shift a bit off of the pure reach and awareness play. And not only are we continuing to monitor visits and impressions to visits, as well as cost per, obviously, we also start to shift into which networks, which publisher partners are driving more starts. You know, ultimately as an acquisition medium, our goal is to bring you, you know, through awareness and consideration to the site. So you can actually start your return. And once you've started your return, you know, to we have other communications and campaigns that, you know, continue to follow you through to your completion. Um, but what we found most interesting and most helpful for us is not only the ability to have the reporting at the network and publisher and station level in order for us to really optimize the, the buys through the season is that, you know, we're also able to see the differences in this between which stations or publishers or content is more likely to deliver visits so we can monitor how well those visits convert to starts. But even then, as we're in that midpoint of the season, which of those stations are really the ones that bring us people who are ready to dive in and start their tax returns. And then obviously when we get to the end of the season, it's all about wrapping it up and getting it done. And so we get heavily into performance mode, which is very much the, the, the strongest performance driven layer of, of our TV, of our video campaigns. Interesting. I, that's really impressive that you guys are able to do that, as you said, in the span of 105 days. Um, I really clung to the fact that you said that you drilled down into networks and publishers and um, analyze performance to make optimizations. Um, would you be able to share um, maybe some of your key learnings from video and creative so far in 2022? Um, certainly, the, you know, the, there's, if we start with creative, um, one of the things that when you see the data isn't surprising, but off the cuff might surprise some people is just how your different creative executions can perform um, better or worse on different networks. So one of, one of the interesting learnings has been for, to, for us to see um, which creative executions do better on one network than the other. So we actually reflight our creative versions um, to the networks based on that. Um, interestingly enough, um, you know, the Hallmark Channel is a very key um, start driver of tax starts. Um, I'm not divulging anything too confidential there. I know our competitors already know that because they're there as well. Um, but you know, as we go through and look at those pieces, we're able to compare how our linear TV impressions are delivering versus our streaming TV impressions. Um, and in particular, how do we use our OTT and our CTV to both expand our reach to people that we can't reach through linear TV, as well as using those more um, program, more targetable or more narrow audience channels to supplement and find niche audience performances. Um, the other thing we've seen regular two years in a row now is our 15 second spots um, are more efficient at driving um, visits and starts. Um, obviously, you know, when you've done any sort of creative testing, you know that your 30 seconds in terms of raising awareness and consideration will generally outperform your 15s. But once we're through that midpoint of season and shift into efficiency mode, 
um, our data, the, the data we get from the reporting helps us identify when to shift particular networks to 100% 15 run versus a mix of 30s and 15s. Wow, so, super interesting. Um, that must be like really exciting to find out that your 15 seconds are just as effective or if not more effective than 30 seconds. Um, it looks like we're running on time and I wish we could keep this conversation going. Um, thank you again so much for being with us today. And it was really insightful for our audience to hear about your guys' approach to cross-screen measurement. Uh, thank you again and uh, back to you, Sean. All right, thank you so much uh, for that, uh, Amy. And thank you for joining us today at TV Disrupt. Super interesting um, presentation and, and also super important. As, you, you, as everybody here knows, cross-screen uh, is the future. It's a key driver for the need for alternative currencies. And uh, Amy's and TaxAx approach to cross-screen um, there's, a, there's a lot, a lot to learn from it. So thank you again, Amy. And speaking of cross screen, we're going to stay, we're going to stay on that topic because on our next session, we're going to welcome the trade desk to TV disrupt. And we're especially excited about having the trade desk here, uh, as we have recently announced our integration and partnership with the trade desk where I spy unified measurement is gonna be the default measurement solution within the trade desk, which of course is very significant because the trade desk is the largest seller of CTV ads and inventory. So to introduce the trade desk and Jonathan Lowe, uh, I'd like to welcome Emily Wood, who is VP for business development here at iSpot uh, to introduce Jonathan. Emily, take it away. Thank you, Sean. I'm honored to introduce the next TV Disrupt guest. Joining us from the trade desk is Jonathan Lowe, who is the Senior Director of Connected TV Partnerships. Welcome, Jonathan. Hi, Emily. Thank you so much for having me today. Really looking forward to uh, chatting more about uh, CTV measurement um, and you know, today. Our pleasure. Thank you for joining us. What an exciting time in the CTV marketplace. Streaming viewership and ad spend are surging, as is the number of streaming platforms. With all of this growth in the marketplace, cross-platform TV ad measurement is increasingly critical for marketers looking to optimize their CTV campaigns and get a true read of advertising performance. What do you see as an important metric for CTV today? Uh, that's a super great question. Um, I think first off is you know, incremental reach is one of the core metrics that advertisers are using today to prove out CTV is reaching audiences who aren't watching uh, linear or cable TV, which is becoming a larger and larger percent of the population. I think we're approaching close to 100 million households now. So being able to target, optimize and measure incremental reach shows the, to show the value of CTV in real time across a holistic TV advertising campaign is one of the most important ways to understand how an ad campaign is effective. Amazing. The Trade Desk recently announced a partnership that makes iSpot the default integrated independent measurement solution for CTV campaigns executed using your platform. Why did you decide to partner with iSpot? Um, it was well. It was clear from our clients the buy side is that they wanted a full funnel understanding uh, that fit within all of their TV uh, TV buys, linear and CTV. So, with that in mind, we wanted to ensure that we could provide our clients with third-party incremental reach solution that could match the capabilities available in 2022. So as an independent, non-objective platform, um, we have relationships with nearly every company in the measurement uh, and measurement marketplace and otherwise, and very few companies can achieve that, which puts us in a very unique position. For us, iSpot serves as one of the key partners in incremental reach uh, that we recommend to our clients. But we also realize clients will have different needs based on their objectives, which is why we have a broader measurement marketplace where clients can choose what's best for them. We also wanted to stand behind one of our core beliefs at the trade desk, and that's transparency. I don't think we could highlight this more by using a third party solution to measure all of our CTV campaigns versus building our own solution and measuring our own, uh, measuring our own homework. One of the things we also liked about iSpot was their reputation for both having the buyers and sellers recognize them as a consistent, independent standard for measurement. And as measurement is one of the most dis discussed topics in our space today, maybe only secondly to uh, identity, 
And both are evolving at such a rapid pace that we all need to keep, keep up with. As independence is one of our core values, we believe in optionality. In this way, all sides can come together to solve challenges and be open to evolution over time. And this builds the best ecosystem for all. Absolutely. Well, we're thrilled to partner with you all, Jonathan. What do you foresee in the future of CTV? A million dollar question. First, I think it's worth taking, to sign, worth taking time to see the progress we've all made together. Mm -hmm. Several years ago, no one would have thought we'd be doing today what we're doing in CTV. TV was the great whale of digital advertising. No one thought it was ever going to become digitized. And now we're seeing all of those possibilities come to life. Now that we've made such progress, we're still seeing things we never thought would happen, such as programmatically buying in live sports or live events. What's more, being able to tie these buys on the big screen to true business outcomes is something unfathomable before. And now it should be part of every CTV and digital advertising campaign. If you can prove that your advertising strategy is leading to sales or an increase in your brand awareness, that's an excellent way to prove marketing's worth and see more budget to, the grow, uh, to grow the brand. What's more, for, what, for what's more ahead, um, I see us becoming smarter in CTV buys. Uh, there are some amazing solutions in market today that can provide a wealth of information around your overall efficiency of CTV campaigns that are underutilized. Leveraging solutions like iSpot to truly get the most out of data decision buying will create a better ecosystem for everyone. User experience should always be taken into consideration. No one wants to see the same advert 10 times in a row or an advert that has no relevance or worse, just a blank screen. Uh, this will require the usage of more data and supplementing met metrics such as reach and frequency, age and gender. We can be a lot more specific than females or males 18 to, 40, uh, 18 to 49. That's a huge gap. <laughs> Lastly, the future will be more of a true transparent marketplace, one where CTV inventory is biddable based on data, not previously agreed upon deals between buyers and sellers. This leads to a more robust decisioning, prevents waste from advertisers' budgets, yields more ROI for publishers, and creates best-in-class advertising experience for, for consumers. All of us here are consumers. I personally watch streaming ads, and I get so frustrated by the ad experience. Mm -hmm now and we know we can all help to make it better for everyone publishers advertisers and the consumer absolutely well jonathan i know that we could talk about this all day um we're so grateful for your time as this has been incredibly insightful thanks again to jonathan lowe for sharing how the trade desk is taking actions today to make the future of ctv buying and measurement transparent and trustworthy back to you sean all right, thank you so much, Jonathan and Emily. It was great to hear from the ad tech side of the industry. And it's super exciting to see how the trade desk is taking actions today to future-proof CTV uh, buying and measurement. And it's a great partnership here between iSpot and the trade desk. So now we've got more alternative currency action coming your way. So moderating our next session is Tracy Chapek, CEO of Mattermore Media and a TV advertising veteran. And to introduce our next panel, which is gonna be made up of Andrea Zapata from Warner Media and Travis Scholes of Paramount. It's off to you, Tracy. Thanks, Sean. Welcome. What an exciting time to be in measurement. It's a pleasure to be with the two of you who are pioneering the future of television currency. First, I'd like to introduce, introduce Andrea Zapata, who is the EVP and Head of Research Data and Insights at Warner Media Ad Sales. Hi, Andrea. Hi, so glad to be here. Good to see you. And, and next is Travis Scholes, who is the SVP of Advanced Advertising at Paramount. Hi, Travis. Hello, excited, excited to be here today. It's great to have you both. Um, TV currency, as we know it, is radically changing right in front of our eyes. Uh, in order to get there, leaders like Paramount and, and Warner have been working diligently to evaluate and implement alternative measurement providers. To start things off, you've both been working for better measurement for years. Can you explain how you're approaching these alternative currencies? Andrea, you wanna go first? Yeah, sure thing. 
Um, I want to just clarify quickly, I've been with Warner Media for about seven months, and there has been a ton of work being done in the industry around alternative measurement. And I got lucky enough to join when it really started ramping up in a big way. Um, and I would say at Warner Media, uh, we have been actually pioneers and in, in innovative um, when it comes to promoting advanced advertising advanced sciences and counting and demonstrating efficacy better. Um, but there was that moment in time when we were literally leaning in and I think having a conversation, not just with one or two potential measurement partners, but actually saying, um, we're gonna start actionizing against not just looking under the hood and understanding methodology, but truly um, selecting preferred partners where we could um, bring to market and at Warner Media, we're doing a POC or a test and learn that allows us to bring advertisers, brands and campaigns us kicking off here in second quarter where we are running live campaigns against um, iSpot, Comscore and VideoAmp specifically. And um, I often say we don't know what we don't know, um, but we put a lot of rigor into um, pressure testing the methodology. So we understood the building blocks and the foundation of what Video amp Comscore and iSpot bring to the table that could provide us what you actually, Tracy, have said before, higher value metrics or different inputs in which to evaluate campaigns and the investments that advertisers put across the portfolio of Warner Media. Um, so yes, it's indeed exciting times. Yeah. Uh, we're learning. We're going to begin to learn a lot more. Um, and this is where sort of it gets really good, I think. Um, but Travis, I know, has been doing much pioneering. So I will send it to you, Travis. Thanks, Andrea. You know, it's an interesting question because the reference, the work that I think the industry has been doing to push measurement forward and to find alternative measurement uh, pieces, that's a, that's a long-standing piece. And, I, and I'll talk a little bit about why I think that's so important. Uh, but that's almost discrete, I think, from how we think about approaching alternate currency. Because measurement and currency are, are divergent. They're no longer the same thing. Uh, mm -hmm. Currency is the data that we use to construct a guarantee for ad sales. It's what we use to transact dollars. It's what buyers and sellers use to negotiate the exchange of media. Measurement is what we use to show how a media campaign is benefiting an advertiser, how it's reinforcing their strategy, how it's driving what they ultimately want to accomplish through, the, through their marketing campaign. These are very connected because it's, it makes sense that you want to be able to uh, um, it makes sense that you want to be able to activate a campaign, plan a campaign, guarantee traffic a campaign and then measure against a consistent data set with a consistent approach. So our approach really has been to try to be agnostic to this. We want to offer as much choice to the market as possible and really let our clients, the buyers decide what is the best data set for their campaign. And at Paramount, we want to be able to support that decision so that it doesn't feel more difficult or challenging uh, when, they, when they do make that type of decision. Um, so I think that from our perspective, we've been doing a lot of this, especially in the last couple of years on both fronts. Uh, alternative measurement is super important right now because everybody sees the fragmentation in viewership, the emergence of CTV as a platform, uh, the, the, sh the shift in linear viewing patterns. And we need a way to really capture how our audiences are consuming our content across all the different ways that we can deliver that in, in a holistic sense. From a currency perspective, Paramount has been really leaning forward to ensure that we are uh, fortified against the upcoming changes in the currency world that are happening you know, across the board, across all companies. Uh, and that's why we've been running these integration projects and we've been building these capabilities and are activating in market today and guaranteeing against alternate currencies right now. Super exciting. Um, well, let's jump into NCAA men's basketball tournaments. And I am truly impressed how you guys really collaborated on this initiative. So Andrea, first let's start with you. Um, how did you work together with multiple partners, including iSpot? Yeah, sure, of course. So I think what, um, it was almost a no brainer. We have a massive tournament um, where we know that there will be a ton of viewing across screens, um, in homes, out of home. Um, and it was a real opportunity to move outside of just a live campaign test and learn from a Warner Media perspective, but to truly, um, talk about the content and the impact that it had with the advertisers that went as they based around that term tournament. Um, I will say it was no small or easy sort of like endeavor. It sounds like a no brainer on paper, but getting two major publishers around it, 
event that is high profile as this with as many advertisers that are invested multiple games um i will tell you it was a testament to our partners um and our partners yes with travis on the publisher side um, but also with our measurement partners full stop um we wanted to make sure that as we were thinking about how to put in an, a different input that wasn't just ratings are up or ratings are down because that is the most base and most blunt of ways in which to um, demonstrate value. We wanted to demonstrate and highlight what each partner brings to the table um, and really shine a bright light on what innovation means when it comes to measurement, not transaction. I love when Travis says that because it is very important that we underscore the difference between measurement and currency. Warner Media is really right now in the business of testing the measurement so we can feel really um, confident in the transaction component. Now I say that this is um, no easy feat, but we wanted to shine a light. Speed was really important to us, right? Making sure we had cross screen components. It is March Madness National Men's Tournament. And so we want to make sure that we were able to look at not the uh, national level, but the regionality, the geo focus of this. And we wanted to make sure that we could um, get at some of the more interesting consumer components around the programming, but then also uh, marry in the um, campaign, the impressions, and, and different types of metrics that we could again shine a light on. So um, I'm gonna, I, I would say, working with Travis and that and his team on the Paramount side has been really fantastic. And also working with the iSpot team in particular, they really leaned in um, and almost um, showed us what we didn't know, what was possible with this type of measurement. So Travis, you know, give us some key findings or, or anything that like surprised you on this initiative. I think to Andrea's point, like we were really excited to see new metrics, to see new capabilities and innovative new ways to look, to use data, right? Data collection to look at, at how both content and advertising are performing in, in a stage that one is huge, right? The basketball tournament has massive viewership, um, but two, it is, it is a very complex thing to measure given, you know, the joint partnership between Paramount and Warner from a, a servicing perspective, et cetera. So it was, really exciting, I think, to see how well all the partners that we worked with on the measurement side, VideoAmp, Comscore, iSpot, uh, Conviva, really kind of stepped up to the plate and really helped us uh, understand, hey, here are the capabilities, right? Here's what the market looks like today. It's not just measuring pure GRP load. It's here's the things that we can do. The things that I think were most surprising to me were the fidelity of, of data that we've been seeing coming back, especially around how audiences are consuming content across platform, where they're choosing to consume content, what it means for an audience to consume content on multiple platforms in general. And I think a lot of those pieces give, uh, give a, a new level of insight, not only into how many eyeballs showed up, but also why. And, and how can we position this and how can we understand how premium content, I mean, March Madness, or, I'm sorry, the, the NCAA <laughs> men's basketball tournament is, is one of the most premium contexts there is. How can people consume that through all of the different premium distribution points that they can enjoy content from Paramount or from Warner? Um, and how does that vary? I mean, I think Andrea hit it, right? There's a lot of things. How is it regional? Uh, how, are, how are folks moving across screen? How are folks moving throughout the tournament? Uh, and I think a lot of those insights were, were, were amazing. We're super excited to be combing through it all right now to build the, the final report, which we will uh, shortly release so that everybody can see how this, how this went. But I mean, the thing that I think was most surprising to me was how far the industry has come from a measurement innovation standpoint. Oh, it's super exciting. Let's go deeper on Conviva. So, um, and how you use their streaming data to get the complete picture. You know, how, how important was this? How critical? You know, Andrea, you want to answer that one? Yeah, absolutely. So I keep joking. It's, it's all powered by Conviva. Um, so every, what's interesting is that when you look at the viewer, um, consumption and you think about how the data is collected, right? So um, all of the measurement firms are in some way, shape or form um, working with set top box or ACR data, right? Um, and they're also able to capture digital, but what Conviva can do if they have a stream ID is to actually truly connect the digital streaming component to the linear component in a very fast turnaround. They make it very easy, turnkey um, and able to, again, um, underscore that, that utility of speed. 
And so um, for us, it, this was part of the learning process, right? So back to Travis's point of, yes, there's great fidelity and there's new metrics, but that doesn't mean that all of this stuff just comes together with the flip of a switch, right? I'm, I'm a, I am a researcher and I remember when people would be like, can't you just give me the data? And they're like, oh, I wish I could, right? Like, I wish I could press that button. Um, but Kaviva was the one where I was like, they're pressing the button and they're making it much easier for us to get access to the data and the insights in a way that I think we'd be hard pressed to do if we didn't have them um, as part of the mix. And so having that partnership across all interoperability is the name of the game, right? Um, in order for them to actually be able to help us steward through and gather that in those insights was, was really important. It's super exciting. I mean, just to see the level of partnership and interoperability is super exciting. And, and let's you know uh, end on the question about speed. How, how important was speed? And, and uh, talk to us about how quickly you were starting to see results. Travis, you wanna take that one? Yeah, I mean, we were seeing results uh, across of our partners within in a time frame that we'd previously was was impossible. Uh, and I think to Andrea's point, right, a lot of this, I, I give credit to Conviva, I give credit to their partnership with iSpot, to their partnership with, with video and with Comscore, because, you know, anyone that's talked to me about this space has uh, knows that I kind of very quickly move from methodology and intent and, and benefits to, and by the way, let's talk about operations and infrastructure and piping, because it ends up that matters so much. Right? We have to be able to actually connect these dots. Uh, and when I talk about how far along I think measurement has, has come, that's a huge piece of it. Yep. We, you know, overnights are, are a thing that um, a lot of folks consider the, the gold standard of fast turn, and they were estimates. And we're seeing actualized data coming through two, three days after the fact, which I think are, is an amazing evolution here. And, and it speaks to as much uh, as an advancement on the, the measurement and the methodology in the innovation space as it does the evolution of the infrastructure that's powering that. And it's, yeah. and it's the ads too. <laughs> it's, it's not the just ads. I think, I think that's the thing, I, I hate to jump in here, but I wanna say, I, you can't take for none of this for granted because it wasn't that long ago and all we had was the overnight, right? And so, and it was just about a, a piece of content, which the content's vitally important, but it is a proxy to reaching a customer set. And now we are we were asking questions like, can I just can I actually talk, can we talk about you know who was in the market for an auto and was happened to be watching this great content? Because you know what, that matters to our advertisers, right? And so this is game changing in so many ways. And I want to underscore, I am a researcher. I remember how valuable the overnight was. I was so jealous when it started becoming, you know, at the local market level. And, and now here we are talking about not just the nuance of a program and an overnight, but we're really thinking about much more sophisticated inputs. And it's because of the power of innovation and technology. Oh my God, it's such an exciting time. I can feel it coming from both of you, like how, like, how powerful this was. Um, so let's jump to uh, upfronts and uh, what you're learning uh, with all the work you guys have done together and for the you know years of work, uh, what you're gonna do differently in this year's upfronts and how brands and agencies um, could or really what they, what we think brands and agencies are gonna see from both Warner and Paramount. Um, Andrea, you wanna take that one first? Sure. So, you know, the upfronts are right around the corner. And um, what I what I think is really important here is that as fast as we all want to move, as quickly as, you know, I think that, you know, that it's not because the innovation isn't already there, but there are many more things that are um, that are necessary for us to contemplate and make sure as equally as ready as the um, as the measurement innovation to make it ready for currency. Um, and so I, from a Warner Media perspective, we've been knee deep with agencies and our, and our partners. And we've heard from them where some, some are ready to go ASAP. Let's go yesterday. Some are saying, you know what? We don't know what we don't know. And we're like, same. Um, and, and some others are like, you know what? Let's just do, let's carve off a piece of our investment where we know that we can confidently utilize different measurement for currency and transaction against advanced audiences, right? We already are, these, these clients are already leaned into DDL. We are looking at the promise of national addressable, and this would be a really good opportunity for us to use um, different currency to measure, again, different APIs. So um, at Warner Media, this is still though very early days. We have stewardship. We have to think about, again, all the piping that I know Travis will probably uh, bring up, but it is so vitally important. It goes back to planning, 
forecasting, targeting, optimizing, reporting, measurement, measuring, and then transacting. And not all of those are where they need to be in order for us to go wide scale in the way that I think in our hearts of hearts we want to, but it wouldn't be prudent. Yeah. Uh, Travis, you know, I'm sure you'll add to that, but also I want to ask the question about um, transacting on demos versus advanced audiences. Do we think we're going to see a move with these, a move towards more advanced with this better measurement? Okay, we've been seeing a move towards transacting against advanced audiences for the last half decade, decade. Um, I think that it's really been picking up steam, especially in the past few years as folks realize well, one, there's been a massive improvement in data availability and data application by the buy side. There have been massive investments in, in, in understanding how buyers can leverage data for the ultimate advertisers and really drive forward their strategy. And that matriculates in advanced audience buying because all of a sudden you want to be able to really harness all of those data investments and then activate in that fashion. Uh, and that's been a huge driver. The, the measurement piece is then connected to that, right? It's the next, the next natural extension. How can we use new data and new methodology to continue to reinforce the power of these, these existing data investments? And I expect that we'll see an acceleration this year in the upfront of audience buying, most definitely. Um, I think that the industry has been moving that way and it's feeling normalized and it's feeling not different than how people have done it in the past. People know how to buy that way and they know how those campaigns will work. Uh, and I think that people are going to be starting to lean into that is a, is a huge piece of their core strategy. From a multi-currency perspective in the upfront, this is going to be a huge topic for Paramount. Um, you know, we're ready to go. So we've been activating uh, for two quarters now against um, VideoAmp, against Comscore, against some of these other currencies that, that we do support. All of the piping, right? We, we've, we've sort of solved that problem on, on the Paramount side. Um, the thing that I think we're really excited for, for this upfront is for our buyers to kind of lean in and, and work with us on this so that we can understand how this works together and we can make alternate currency feel like audiences where it's just normalized, right? Yeah. This is something that we can just do. It doesn't feel different. It doesn't feel unusual. This is just the way that we can better align to the advertiser's ultimate end strategy. Oh my God, that's just so exciting. So let's do two last questions, kind of rapid fire if we can. Um, so, you know, a lot of change is happening and I'm curious when we talk about these alternative currencies, do we see this as like a one to two year transition or more like a three to five year, you know, to get really the majority of the marketplace on an alternative currency. So, uh, Andrea, why don't we start with you? Is it a short, shorter term or a longer term? I don't like it, but it's going to be a longer term. As much as I've always tried to say, how do we push? How do we push? How do we push? And Travis, you go with your one and two. I, I've got my money on that too. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I fully disagree. I think it's going to be it's going to be a one to two. It's going to be a much faster play, and and that's not necessarily because of the speed that you know the the new kind of ecosystem is evolving, the new multi currency players, but also the fact that in two years measurement changes writ large. Yeah. Uh, the incumbent measurement provider is changing their data sets, their entire methodology. A lot of the metrics that we've been trading on for decades are about to go away. And at that point, the industry is, you know, uh, changed fundamentally from a measurement and a currency standpoint. That'll be a forcing function for, I think, everyone to stand around and say, hey, well, it's all different anyway. Which of these partners, which of these data sets, which of these approaches actually can fit for me? Because the, the you know, inertia of, well, I know how it works with the incumbent will be gone. Yep. Very exciting. Lots of change coming. Okay, so last question. Uh, what is the most important thing or piece of advice you could give to brands and agencies what they can do right now to prepare for these changes ahead? Travis, you want to start that one? Let's get started. Um, let's carve off some of that investment. Let's start doing this together. Let's know what this looks like. If we're on a two-year time horizon, the time to get started is now. Okay, carve off some investment. Andrea? Same. And keep the dialogue open. The more that we can have the kind of dialogue that we're having right now between publishers, between the agencies, it will help us actually get to that one to two year um, sort of goal. And I think that that is where we are right now. And what's been so wonderful is having the real conversations with the measurement partners like iSpot, who have been so open with how they're doing things. And it's, it's, it's refreshing. So the dialogue must continue but the actionizing of it is absolutely crucial. 
Well, thank you both for sharing your perspective. Oh my gosh, what an exciting time this is. And it's been a pleasure to be with uh, two industry leading people who are trying to push this marketplace forward. And I think that uh, wraps it up. So back to you, Sean. All right, thank you so much, Tracy. And a huge thank you to Andrea uh, and, and Travis from Warner Media and, and Paramount. And, and you know, I often hear Kelly from NBCU say that measurement and alternative currency is a team sport. So I love hearing all of the great collaborations that are going on across the industry with this latest one being across the NCAA uh, tournament that you just uh, heard about. All right, we are in the home stretch of TV Disrupt Everyone. And unfortunately, uh, my cats, the CMO of T-Mobile could not join us today here live at TV Disrupt. So instead, I drove over to T-Mobile headquarters this morning where we recorded our interview with my cats at the T-Mobile studio. Um, so with that, let's go over to uh, Factoria, which is here in Bellevue, Washington, for an interview with my cats, T CMO of T-Mobile. All right, everyone, I am here with uh, Mike Katz, Chief Marketing Officer of T-Mobile. Thank you for joining TV Disrupt. Yeah, thanks for having me, Sean. Now, as I mentioned, Mike couldn't join us live, so I drove across town here uh, to T-Mobile's headquarters in Bellevue, Washington, which is also where iSpot's headquarters are here. And uh, we are in uh, Mike's living room. <laughs> Uh, or actually, it's, it's a brand new studio you guys have just built here, right? We have. I, I think if I installed the T into my real living room, I'd have some uh, explaining to do at home. Yeah, I'm sure, I'm sure you would. <laughs> I'm sure you would. Uh, now, Mike, you were just named Chief Marketing Officer of T-Mobile recently, so congrats on that. Thanks. But you are no stranger to T-Mobile. Um, so you have been at T-Mobile for how long now? This is my 24th year at T-Mobile. That is amazing. That, yeah, that, I, was, that. I, I was telling you off camera, the labor laws were a lot different back then. So, you know, you could start when you were 12 <laughs> and it was cool and, yeah. you know, it was a different time. Yeah, because I would say, you don't even look old enough to have worked for 24 years. <laughs> so so that, that's amazing. So obviously, you're no stranger mm -hmm. to T-Mobile. So can you take our audience through just briefly, like your history here at T-Mobile? Because yeah. you've obviously had a lot of leadership positions and you've done a lot here. So I'd love to hear more about that. Yeah, it's been, you know, for me, an amazing experience. I, I, st I started with the predecessor company of T-Mobile, which was called Voice Dream Wireless, a small regional wireless company. And I actually started while I was still in college as a part-time seasonal employee. Uh, I, had, I had a job working at a couple of very illustrious retailers selling Voice Dream inside of them. One was Sears and one was Circuit City. So yeah, it kind of, kind of takes you what was going on 24 years ago. And then I've had the opportunity to do a bunch of different things in my career. I, sp I spent the first portion of my career, probably five or six years, in sales roles. Uh, I, I moved up to, to Bellevue in 2007 and worked in our corporate strategy organization. And then I took on several different roles inside marketing, starting with running our prepaid business in marketing. Uh, I then ran our consumer marketing business. I spent the last six years running our business, our B2B business, uh, more, more in like a general manager job. I was the president of our B2B business. And then, yeah, just recently uh, came back into consumer marketing and run all of marketing as CMO. Right. So, um, and can you tell the audience a little bit about yourself? So, where were you born? I was born, I, I, was, I was born technically in Houston, Texas. Okay. And, but I li we only lived, my parents both went to school in Texas. We only lived there for a couple months. Uh, I grew up in Colorado. So I consider, I consider myself, uh, yeah. although not technically, and I, sh I don't want to admit this on TV, a Colorado native, but I was technically <laughs> born in Houston. And where'd you go to college? I went to college at Colorado State University. Yeah. Did you play any sports? I did. I, I, I started at Colorado State as a baseball player, uh, then became injured, then uh, led me to my seasonal part-time job <laughs> at Voice Dream. <laughs> And how, you have any kids? How many kids you got? Uh, we have four children, and we've got some range at the cat's house. I, I have a 16-year-old daughter who's going to be a senior next year. And I have a 14-year-old son, an 11-year-old daughter, and then I have a 5-year-old son who will be a kindergartner next yeah, year. That's, yeah. that's a great, great, uh, great range. All right, so let's talk about, so TV Disrupt is all about the disruption that's happening in measurement. And you guys know all about Disruption. I want to talk a little bit about the DNA of disruption. Can you talk about 
have T-Mobile disrupted the, the wireless uh, space? Yeah, I mean, you know, a, a big part of our success over this last 10 years was our strategy to take what we believed was a pretty broken industry and flip it on its head. You know, if you, if you go back in wireless 10 years ago, this was an industry that people loved the technology. Even 10 years ago, your phone was like the most important thing that you had. You, you, it would be like the one thing that if you left on a road trip and you realized you didn't have your phone, you would actually turn around and go get. So people loved the technology, but they hated the people that gave it to them. They hated it. And they hated it because they treated, the, the, the carriers treated people terrible. They treated people terrible and they had a bunch of one-sided rules that worked for them but not for customers. And when, when we launched the Uncarrier, which is, which is what we've uh, called ourselves, our strategy really was to center ourselves around customers. You know, really, really understand what customers' expectations were of this category, and ensure that we had uh, a culture and a, a set of principles that were built around delighting customers and bringing them the, the most incredible customer experiences, and then positioning ourselves as the antithesis of the other guys. You know, what, all the things that they did, our plan was to go undo them. And we, we started that in 2013 with a series of moves that started with eliminating contracts. I mean, can you, you remember that? Like 10 years ago, people still had contracts yeah. for their wireless yeah. phone. And if you, did, if you didn't sign a contract, you couldn't get a phone. Once you're in a contract, it was almost impossible to leave because right. you had hundreds of dollars of fees. So we eliminated contracts. We eliminated international roaming. We uh, brought unlimited wireless services for the first time into the U.S. Right. And so one by one, we, we knocked down all these pain points. And one of our measures of success certainly was growth, which the, it, led to, it led to tremendous growth. But a big measure of success for us was, were we changing the industry? Were we causing the other guys to actually go do these, these exact same things? Right. And what we've seen over the, the last 10 years is our competitors have copied almost every single thing that we've done, and it's been for the, to the benefit of customers. Right. The entire satisfaction of this category has gone up as a result of some of the fundamental changes that we drove into the industry. Yeah. So th it's so interesting because this sounds like everything that's 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 happening in measurement uh, today. In fact, we should almost call it the unmeasurement uh, <laughs> movement here. But but it, a lot of the similar things that are happening uh, in, in 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 wireless are happening in measurement. People aren't happy with what's being delivered. Uh, the service that's being delivered is not really keeping up with demands. Uh, the industry has changed. The, the service itself has to change uh, to service uh, both consumers and advertisers. So what, what lessons can we take as an industry here in, in measurement from what you guys have gone through, the transformation of, of your industry? What parallels do you see here? Yeah, I, I think a couple. Um, for me, it, it starts with what I was mentioning a second ago. It starts with the customer. I, I think it's so important that you understand the customer who they are, what their expectations are, and in, and in the case of what we're talking about here, where are they? Where are they and how are they consuming content? And like you just said, I, I think that's probably one of the most dramatic changes that we've seen over certainly the last decade, but you right. know, especially over the last few years is cust uh, c customers, consumers, people that we're trying to reach are consuming content in completely new places. You know, uh, it's a lot of content consumption has shifted from linear TV into streaming services. Right. Uh, a lot of the content is being, is being time shifted and not being consumed real time anymore. Uh, so I, I, I think it starts with first really having a solid understanding of what, what's happening with the customer, where they are, and how they're consuming content. Um, I, I think that's, that's first and foremost. Um, and then I, I, I think, you know, for me and for us at least, you know, we, we are kind of in a position where even though we're a big advertiser, uh, we operate in one of the most advertised spaces right. in, in, out of any industry in the country. Right. And uh, I I, our budget still is smaller than the other guys, so I have to make every single dollar work harder. And it really is imperative for us then that we are making data-driven decisions, yeah. that we are understanding you know, what, is, what is the impact of every dollar that we're spending, right. and t uh, reading, reading the impact quickly getting the data and then uh, reacting and optimizing what, what we're doing. And we have to have a, uh, a virtuous cycle of, of uh, learning, receiving data, and then, and then changing our executions. Um, because because I, we have the burden of, like I said, making every single one of our dollars work right. harder. 
way. And, and so you guys have sort of understood, I, I believe, for a while now that the legacy of measurement really hasn't served the needs of the advertiser, right? You guys have really been using non-Nielsen yeah. measurement approaches since 2015, yeah. uh, I believe. So, so are, w what were some of the areas that you fe felt like you guys had to go into a different, a non-legacy, the, the unmeasurement <laughs> solution? Yeah, 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 I mean, I think for us it was a couple things. One, it was, you know, some of the traditional measurement systems actually were recording audience when there was no audience present. You know, the TV could be turned off and right. cable boxes on and it, and it looks like somebody's watching programming. I think that's, that, that was a big one. And then I think the second one is the trend that we were talking about a second ago, which is audiences moving from a linear TV formats right. into streaming formats. And we needed measurement systems that, ca that captured all of that, right. uh, especially as the, the trend uh, increases and, and more and more people are consuming on, on streaming. So I, th I think for us, those were a couple of the really, really big ones. Um, you know, we, we wanted to make sure that we had the most accurate and most real-time view of where our customers that we were trying to target were. Right. And, you know, we feel like some of the you know, new contemporary um, people out there, like, like iSpot, were, were ones that uh, could give us a right. more current real-time right. view. And you guys saw that. I mean, you guys for years and years have been investing in mm. where the consumer is and, and have been ahead of the curve. So it's, it's really great, uh, great to see that. So let's talk about, so obviously you, you've been uh, a senior executive at T-Mobile for a long time, so you know the, the lay of the land. But as chief marketing officer, what are your top goals? How, how will your success be measured here as chief marketing officer? Yeah, well, a, a couple of very specific things. The first one probably most chief marketing officers feel like, but I, I think for me, one of the things that I will, be, I will be judged on, and frankly I'm judging myself on, is are we creating a more unique, distinct brand? Right. You know, are, are we, when, when customers look at T-Mobile and they compare us to the two people I compete against, uh, do they understand and see us as something different than, the, than those other guys? And I, I think we've done a great job of that for years, and I think there's a lot more we can do. And I, I feel so fortunate in starting this job at the time that I am, because 10 years ago when we were uh, first launching on Carrier, we were able to create this incredible differentiation with honestly not a whole lot of assets. You know, and 10 years ago we didn't have the best network. Uh, we were a standalone company. We didn't have the kind of scale that we have now. Shoot, we didn't even have the iPhone 10 years ago. Uh, and, I look at, and I look at the assets that we have today. Uh, today we definitively have the best 5G network. Uh, we have a scale that we've never seen before post our merger with Sprint. Um, and, you know, we still have this incredible service DNA that lives throughout the, the entire combined company. So I feel really fortunate that we have a ton of assets and tools to use to create meaningful, impactful differentiation with our two competitors. So that's a one big one for me. And then the second big one, uh, and I think it's, it overlaps a lot of the things that we were talking about, is um, are we becoming a more simple, more digitalized company? And, and, and really for me, that's for two big reasons. The first and primary one is, uh, are we creating better customer experiences? Are we meeting the expectations of customers? Are we allowing customers to do the things that they want to do when and where they want to do them th through digital contemporary experiences? Right. And then the second part of that for me is uh, the modernization of marketing. Uh, you know, leveraging uh, data that we have about customers and prospects and creating more contextualized, personalized marketing journeys right. for our customers. I, I think those are going to be the big things right. that I, I am measured on and I'm measuring myself yeah, on. No, that's a great roadmap. And uh, so obviously we're here at, at TV Disrupt. This is uh, the closing session mm -hmm. here for a, a great event. And, and the, the bulk of the conversation here is the real shift in the marketplace to alternative cur currencies, right? So advertisers have been used to buying based on a single currency for the last 75 years. And uh, the market is shifting now to alternative currencies, to different ways to transact, whether it's cross-screen yeah. or outcome-based uh, transactions. Obviously, you guys have leaned into those notions for yeah. many, many years. Uh, but how do you feel about these shifts? Uh, do, do you think that the T-Mobile will be ready and, and, and willing to, to lean into transacting and into a, and alternative currencies in, in the near future? Um, I would say yes to both, re yeah. willing and ready and, and starting to do a lot of experimentation there. And, and I do, we still do think, even though we're a bigger company and we have a lot more scale, we still think being nimble and moving fast 
is still a huge strategic advantage and right. and priority for us. Right. And I, I think, um, you know, again, not to not to like use like lame sports analogies, but like skating where the puck is going is right. super super important. And yeah. you've got to you've got to be uh, aware and realistic about the fact that the market is changing. And I think the people that uh, are the first movers are going to be the ones that that win. Right. And so for for us, you know, th thinking thinking about this, uh, both experimenting and, and taking some some um, some swings are going to be really important for us. Yeah, that's well said. All right, Mike, thank you so much for having me over to this awesome uh, studio you guys built here. It's great to see you, and thank you for being on TV. Yeah, Disrupt. thank you so much. It's great right, being you, here. Mike. Thank you. All right, thank you so much, Mike. Uh, thank you for having me um, over at T-Mobile headquarters and for the wonderful interview and insights. All right, so what I wanna do now is uh, really just wrap up. And first and foremost, I wanna thank all of our amazing speakers today. I wanna thank Kelly, Lauren, Amy, Jonathan, Andrea, and Travis. And of course, uh, my cats uh, from, from T-Mobile. I also wanna thank our moderators, Emily and Tracy. And a huge, huge thank you to the iSpot uh, marketing team, especially Sammy and Amelia for putting on this, uh, this uh, great event. So with that, I wanna send out a huge thank you to all of you for being here today and joining us on this journey to a new era of measurement and currency. I'm Sean Mueller, CEO of iSpot. You can see my email here on the screen. Feel free to email me at any time. I'm at sean at iSpot.tv. And thank you again for joining today.